Welcome to the latest edition of the Hudson County Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Jim Hagen. With me today is a very, very special guest and probably is pr- perhaps the best all-around athlete to ever come out of West Hudson. And yes, Harrison is part of Hudson County. A lot of people might think otherwise, but it truly is. And, um, and he was a 2,000-point scorer at Harrison High School in basketball. But more importantly, he made his mark in football where he went on to play college football at Rutgers. Had a great career uh, with the Scarlet Knights. Then went on to play in the NFL with three teams, first the New England Patriots. Um, then he went on to play with the New York Jets, where he had his most success. And then he ended up with the, New, uh, with the Miami Dolphins. And then recently, he's carved a new career out as being, well, it's not so much new anymore, though, is it? Though? You've been around a while, but he's got a career as a broadcaster, both with SNY, and he's also the color commentator for the Rutgers, uh, Rutgers football games on radio. And it's my good friend, Ray Lucas. Ray, how are you doing today, buddy? Jimmy, always a pleasure to talk to you, my friend. And it's always a pleasure to talk to you. So, all right, let's turn the clock back, all the way back. And I mean all the way back. No, I'm kidding. Uh, when you were a kid in Harrison and growing up. Yeah, and you, you can definitely say all the way back, though, Jimmy. I'm a long freaking time, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, but growing up was, was football or be, be, were all three sports part of your life growing up as a kid? Yes, they were definitely, uh, especially because in Harrison, you were you you did play all three sports. It, it was kind of like the unwritten rule that if you were, you know, you you just that's what you did every season. There was something to do, and my best friend, my brothers, uh, did that stuff. So it was all just relative, man. We did everything. Okay. Now, um, before we go any further, can we talk a little bit about your family dy- dynamics? I know you spoke about it a lot. Your book, which was a great book, and, and I got an autographed copy of it, so I'm very, very fortunate. Well, but of course, yeah. you've been covering me forever, Jimmy. Forever. I expect, brother. That's true. No, well, that's damn sure. I, you know, I had a lot of fun covering your college. That was for sure. But um, when uh, you talk a little bit about your talk a little bit about your family dynamics and and um, you know, was it difficult at all being uh, coming from your for coming from from the family? You know, your mother, your mother, uh, your, your father is not your biological father, but you always have treated him as as your father, and, and I don't think you even consider anybody else but being this man being your father and um and was it difficult growing up in harrison uh being part of a, a biracial family well, well you know the, the funny thing is when you're young you know and my sister is white um it just you know when you're young you don't realize that's your dad that's your mom you know i didn't i didn't know two white people could make a black baby that, that, <laughs> that didn't register right in the beginning but as i got older uh, you know, and, and it was tough, you know, being probably one of the only black kids in an in, in Irish kind of town. And, and I'm not going to lie to you and say that people didn't block the exits of me at Holy Cross. And I, I tell a lot of people, I said, you know, I got my shakes and my wheels from, you know, running away from, you know, people blocking doors so I couldn't get out. And then also <laughs> the that you actually get your butt kicked where you become pretty efficient in, in kicking butt yourself. Uh, I never knew my real father. Uh, but he raised me since the day I was born. And, you know, I, I am a mama's boy. Uh, but, you know, as you got older, I, I asked my father, I said, you know what, Pop, uh, how, how, how'd you do it? You know what I mean? Because I, I told him, I said, if my wife, you know, she's Cuban, if she had a, ba- a blonde hair, baby, blue eyed kid, I'd be gone, so. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I asked my dad. He just yeah, unfortunately, all three of your kids look like you. So, you know, like yes, this. Yes, yeah. Yeah. I don't have to worry about that. Don't have to worry about that. Dad, they, they're your kids. There's no question. I asked my dad, why? How? How'd you do it? He said, he just, it was a very simple answer. And he said, I loved your mother too much. Okay, wow. He raised me like I was his own. And, and you're right. I, I don't have uh, another father. That is my dad. Uh, he's the greatest man that I've ever met. Uh, he, he, you know, all his mannerisms, the way he taught us, the way he raised us. Uh, is exactly the way I kind of raised my, my kids. And, uh, you know, my, like I said, my, my parents, my sister are, you know, my inner circle. I mean, I have my wife. I have my, my three beautiful daughters. And, uh, you know, everything I learned, I learned from my dad and my mom. And uh, he's, just, he's just that kind of dude. He's just a great man. He's just a, an absolute great man walking the earth. I, and I wholeheartedly agree. I, I adore your father. He's one of the nicest people I've ever met in my life. And he's just a... Uh... 
he's a joy to be around. But was there were there were there pressures at all growing up as a kid being That's an African American and like being like yeah. I said, Jimmy, you know, you know, when you when you are the only black kid in in, in an old basically Irish Italian town, uh, got it. Yeah, you, you get you get called the words, you get called the N word, you get called it a lot. Uh, you know, and the funny part is, you know, when you look back now, it, it, it would be funny because my friends would be like, oh, look at that N over there. And they'd be like, no offense, right? <laughs> you know, and, and, and at the time, Jimmy, you, know, you don't really think, you're like, oh, okay, like, no big deal. But in, in actuality, it was offense. Yeah. You know I mean, when you get older and you get a little bit more smarter and you get, you know, you, you see, you know, the other, the other places outside of the town of Harrison, I mean. Right. Understand the reasoning and stuff like that, but uh, I wouldn't trade growing up in Harrison for anything in the whole entire world. It, it was a close knit community. Uh, they all, you know, the older people, like all the older high school guys, they looked out for the younger people. Uh, Mayor Rogers, uh, especially when, when you know when I was younger, if you didn't belong in Harrison, you got police escort right out of the town of Harrison. <laughs> uh, and, and then you know, and this is going back a long way, so you know you, you couldn't get in trouble about it now. Probably you can get in trouble today, but. There was a sense of community. Uh, all the cops were my football coaches. Yep. Oh, uh, yeah, that's for sure. The Guerreros, the, the Ronnie Catcherbones. I mean, people sometimes look at, you know, other people, and they say, oh, well, what does he do? And, and they make judgments on that. But every single freaking coach I had was caring, uh, taught me how to be tough, taught me what the game of football was all about. And I'm sure you saw some of our high school games that if you were standing still, you got knocked off. Uh, all legal, of course, but uh, we were known as probably one of the dirtiest teams because we played to the whistle. Right. And, and there's nothing dirty about it. It's just if you were standing around taking a break off, you got decleated. Yeah. And, and that's how Harrison football was. Uh, you know, and, and I see a lot of the younger kids that were, you know, they, that came after I came, and, and it was still the same. You know what I mean? We, we instilled. Listen, we knew if you came to Harrison, and don't forget where my stadium was. You know what I mean? There was Snake River was on one side, a lumber yard on the other, <laughs> and a freaking trucking place on the other. So there was right. one way in, one way out. And you knew if you played Harrison, you were leaving with bruises. You were going to be in the ice bath, and you were going to have ice packs on the trip home because that's just how we played. That's true. And and it was definitely the uh, the hardest field to play on, too, because it was rock hard. It was not... Yeah, it was, there was no grass. There, there was no grass, grass no. Yeah. That's the Harrison way, baby. That's it. I hear you. So, all right. So, of the three sports, Ray, what was the first one that you were introduced to? And as, at a young age, which did you feel that you were the best at? I would definitely say basketball. It, it was natural to me. Uh, I remember I was in sixth grade at Holy Cross, and we were in the CYO. So, you played like Washington Middle School, and, and OLC at the time had a team. Right. And I remember being in the fifth grade playing eighth grade. Okay. Uh, and, and, you know, you, at, at that young age, it doesn't, you, know, you don't realize you moved up three levels. It was just, I love the game of basketball. You know what I mean? I, I went to five star every single year when I was in high school. Oh, did you really? Uh, okay. Oh, yeah. Man, yeah. Our guard ball man took good care of me when I was out there. I mean, I. I, I so did you have to wait tables too, like everybody else? Oh, yeah. Man, yeah. That's the special guys. And, you know, you didn't have to pay for the the right. two times I had to pay. After that, I didn't have to pay. Okay. So I, I kind of won hard over. Uh, I remember Rick Pitino coming in and speaking, and uh, there was a guy named McCafferty. <laughs> he played for Duke. Yep, Billy McCafferty. Well, Rick Pitino comes to speak, and, and next to Parcells, he's probably one of the greatest speakers that I've ever even heard of. You'll hear a pin drop when he was talking. And he pulled me and McCafferty up, and that was like the highlight of my three years at, at you know, Five star was because I was in the presence of probably one of the greatest shooters in the state of New Jersey or wherever he was from. Right, he was from New Jersey. Yeah. Yeah. Out myself. Yeah. So I really thought I was going to be a professional basketball player uh, early on, in, in, in you know, in the beginning. Okay. So, um, and did you, when did baseball stop, or did you play baseball through high school too? Oh, yeah. 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 I was all state in baseball too in high school. Wow. Okay. See yeah, that because I was a pitcher, man. I threw high. I threw straight heat. Okay. Well, I was probably in the nineties, but uh, I remember a uh, White Sox guy came to scout our our catcher, and uh, he was like, "Man, you got some serious movement on your ball." And he said, "What? What are the two pitches you gonna throw?" I said, "Fastball, palm ball, curveball." He goes, "You need a whole other reference." Well, I was like, "You know, this is my senior year." I'm like, "I ain't missing my arm." <laughs> yeah, first of all, I'm going Rutgers. Yeah. Forget about baseball. I'm going to play ball in my home state. Make my state. 
stayed great. You know, we had we had tons, tons like the Jackson Malik, you know, Jackson were, were two people that kind of committed. Jay Bellamy was another guy. Yep. And then me and Alcides Catano, who played at Elizabeth, played in both the North and South basketball and football games. Right. And uh, he was like, I can't wait to get to Rutgers. So, you know, Bruce Presley's another one that was like a five-star recruit, one of the best running backs in, in, the, in the entire state of New Jersey. I saw that everybody was staying home. And it just clicked for me. And, and to be honest with you, too, I, listen, I was a freaking mama's boy. I couldn't be that far away from my mom. There you go. But, but at the same time, I, I kind of looked at it. And I could have went anywhere in the country for football. Yep. Uh, and I just thought about it for a second. I'd say, I said to myself, no, why why make other states great when this is where I come from? You know what I mean? My family could come see me play. Even though I was away at school and it was only a half hour away, I was away at school. But it was close enough for me to when I got sick, homesickness to go see my mom. Right, but you were you were getting recruited big time uh, as a basketball player as well, because that's when I first met you. Is that your first one of your first recruiting trips as a basketball player was to St. Peter's College, and they and you walked into my office when I was the SID at St. Peter's, and they said, "This is Ray Lucas." I said, "I know who he is," you know. So, uh, but you. St. Peter's recruited you heavily. Teddy Fury wanted you in the worst way. He he really wanted you big time basketball wise. Yeah, I mean, I had Wake Forest. Jerry Rainwright was one of the coaches there, and he was just like, "Please, whatever you need, whatever you want, this is the right place." So John Calipari was in my my home when you know when that was all Bobby Hurley seniors doing. Yeah. Because <laughs> I played for him in AAU. Right. And uh, he said. John Carpenter told me because you can play with Camby, you can play with all these guys. You'll start as soon as you walk in. He said, you're making a big mistake. And I said, I, I really don't think I am. You know what I mean? I went to Syracuse for a double visit basketball and football, Virginia, a double visit basketball and football. It just, you know, it kind of dawned on me. I really thought I was like North Carolina Duke material. Okay. I went to schools of basketball and were like, get the hell out of here. <laughs> so it kind of sent me a message. Like, I, I could have went to any country in the in the whole state of the United States to play Division One football. I just decided it was time to stay home and, and make my state great. All right. Well, talk, go back to your high school days a little bit. And I get lost in the shuffle a little bit. I know you played for Coach Borges at, at Harrison, but... Yeah. Did you win the state championship your senior year, or was that the year no, after that, you that left? That was my eighth grade year, and, and it's funny you bring this up because my idol and my best friend now were like, you know, I had the same best friends you know, since I've been in Harrison younger. His name was Mickey Rowe. Okay. And Mickey Rowe was a quarterback. He won a state championship. I'll never forget. You know, this is the type of. And he ended up playing football at St. Peter's. <laughs> but no, Muhlenberg. Oh, Muhlenberg? Oh, okay. Yeah, but don't forget, this guy had four rides for Division One programs, and he broke his ankle in the middle of senior season. That's how I got brought up to varsity to play quarterback when my brother got, you know, broke his ankle. And, and it was kind of weird because they rescinded a lot of offers. On Mickey, really? Yeah, they rescinded a lot of offers. Wow. And, and Mickey, listen, Mickey is brilliant. I mean, the guy is, you know, he's probably, and all my best friends, he's probably the craziest one out of all of us, but he was also brilliant. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So he went to Muhlenberg. He played ball there for a little while. Uh, you know, he went on to become working as a lawyer for Blake Rome. He was probably one of the youngest partners there. And, yep. Uh, but I remember saying something to Mickey because you know how typical Harrison kids are. I remember we used to have to go watch them practice. So the big, you know, the wisest that I am, I, I said to him, man, you suck to Mickey. <laughs> and he said, you know what? Let me tell you a short story, Luke. Uh, when you're sitting bench varsity as a freshman, then you can come talk to me. Now, okay. Jim, you know how football is in my hometown. Right. You know how it was anyway. Oh, it was, but right. If you could sit bench varsity as a freshman, not even play, that was an honor. Big time. Big time. And at the time when he said it to me, I was like, man, shut up. That's a terrible comeback. You know what I mean? But at the same time, I said bench varsity. I mean, I played a little bit as my freshman year because I could throw the ball 77 yards. But, right. Uh, I got what he was saying to me, you know what I mean? And that changed the whole way of me thinking that, you know, you, you, you didn't even, you know, I, I hate to use this analogy, but pee a drop. How dare you say something to somebody that has, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, that's true. And, and uh, it was another lesson. I, I call them Harrison lesson, lessons that I learned and then I applied to my craft is that I wasn't going to let anybody outwork me. Okay. No one was going to outwork me. And my goal when I was in eighth grade, was to sit bench varsity. I know that sounds like a crappy goal. No, that's a, that's a that's a huge goal at that point because hardly anybody else did. Yeah, I mean, 
but but to me, after the fact, I was like, man, I gotta sit back varsity. Like, I know that's shit, shit goal, but I mean, I'm sorry to curse. That's I'm right. Crap goal, but you know that that was my agenda. Okay, so um, so what year is that that they won the states? They won the states in '88. Okay, six. Okay, and eighty-six or eighty-seven, Jim. I'm not. I'm not really sure. Yeah, all right. And I, I should, I should have looked that up or whatever. Okay. Eighty-seven. Eighty-seven. Right. I was in eighth grade, and we went. I went to school a year after that. All right. And he was only a junior when he won the state championship. Okay. So, but was that then? Did you say to yourself, "Wow, we could have a, we could have a great run here at Iverson. It's actually legitimate that we could have that. This is something more than than soccer in this town. We could actually win well, in football." Well, here's Uh, it was a football town. I, I never lost in Pop Warner, not one game. I never lost. We were BCSL champions every single year. So to me, it wasn't like when we get to high school, we got a shot. We already knew we had a shot because we were physical. And a lot of teams don't like physical. You know what I mean? Okay. And, and I knew we were going to be good at football because, again, I think I lost two games in four years as, as, as a high school Student playing football. Oh, is that true? Really? You only lost two games in four years, yeah. and yet you didn't win a state championship? Wow, that's wild. No, no. Well, you know how that... Was yeah. There were sometimes PowerPoints. Sometimes you got you, you yeah, would go 8-1, and one, you wouldn't get in. Get yeah. Hudson County always gets screwed. Uh, well, especially when you were playing in the BCSL, and you yeah. were playing all Group 1 schools, and you were Group 2, you were not getting in. If you lost no, the game, you were not getting in. You basically had to be undefeated. Yeah. No question. No question. So, all right. So... Uh, and then, you yeah, obviously, so you played for Borges, though? You Borges was your coach? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course. Okay. And and was uh, Carlos Samoa your assistant? Is his assistant his best friend? Well, I, back then, it was, it, was, it was Ralph Borges. It was one of his sons. Richie? And it was Larry Manning, who was my quarterback coach and offensive coordinator. And then it was Bill Hartman. Okay. Reggie Howell, Vinny Ferrero. I mean, we, we our whole staff was stacked. Okay. Alan Dolphin, who was my homeroom teacher, and... I didn't know this at the time. Uh, you know, when you get to Harrison High, you get one home room. That's your home room for your entire four years. Okay. It just so happens that Alan Dolphin was my home room teacher, my football coach. But he he, he was a type of individual. Like, you know, he took, he took a liking and took, uh, he started sending my tapes out, which I had no idea about when I was a freshman, when I was a freshman and sophomore in high school. Is that true? Really? I didn't yeah, know that either. Yeah, so, so, like, the reason why I was getting so heavily because Alan Dauphin, in his spare time, after after practice, after teaching all day, sent my tapes out to different schools, and that's how the interest dropped up. Like, you know, I'm six foot four. Yeah, I was a buck thirty eight or buck sixty eight. <laughs> buck thirty eight. We would have had to give you a couple of hamburgers. No, no, I, I was paper thin. I mean, if there was a good test of wind, it might fuck it. Excuse me, it might have blown me over. So. All right, so. Um, so, so playing football, you got to play for somebody like Ralph Borges, who who knows knew more football than either one of us will ever know in our lifetime. I mean, the man was an absolute football genius, and he won on every single level. Um, He's a great man, too, great, not just a coach. Great man. I used to talk to him every single Sunday morning. Every I could I could time my clock to it. Uh, Twenty after eight, every every set Sunday morning, the phone would ring and say, "Jimmy, where'd you go yesterday?" And I had to tell him what high school game I went to, and he wanted me to tell him about all the, about the whole game that I went to. That's and that was that, that, that was the way Coach was. Gorgeous. He was the he was the best. I loved him dearly. So, yeah. but what was it? What was it like to play for somebody like that that had, you know, a multitude of experience in coaching before you even got to him? Well, well again, like I said, you you won a state championship in Harrison for football, which which I don't even know if it was done in the past or if no. it was ever done after that. No, I think it was no. The yeah, lone one. Thing, you know, Borges, he, he was hysterical, though, because he couldn't remember anybody's name. No, everybody was by the numbers. So so he said the one time... Uh, I oh, he remembered your name, though. No, no, here's the best story. Okay. I think it was after our, my, fresh, my freshman year, he has a team meeting with the football team, and we had a running back named Joe De Silva. Okay. So I mean, he was he could, like, speak speed of light. And he said uh, to the guys, don't forget, we got DeLuca. So he put Joe De Silva and Ray Lucas at, at together. <laughs> so we're all. And he became the Luca. That's not bad. That's that's a popular name. 
Yeah, yeah. we don't got no duplicates on our team. Uh, but again, like I said, uh, he, he was just, you know, he was just a good, great coach. Right. And a great, and, a, and an even better man. There's no question. Yeah, he definitely was. Yeah. No. And then who did you play for uh, in your other two sports? Who was the basketball coach at that time? Freddie Compensatory, which we were, we won a section, a state section tournament by junior year. I think we won a state section. We were a game away to go into the final four of Rutgers. Okay. Uh, Fred Compensatory, probably one of the best in-game coaches. Like, you know, last minute, we need a shot. I mean, the stuff he threw up. Uh, was just absolutely amazing. And Kopp was type of individual that got the best out of the people. Like, he knew how to treat certain... Listen, coaching to me is very difficult for this, for the main reason. You have to know who to yell at. You have to know who you need to pick up. You have to know who you need to dig in somebody's rear end. And, and Kopp knew all of that. Okay. Like, he was he was in a great in-game coacher. Uh, a great influence. Like, he took us down to the shore, this whole basketball team, down to the shore house. We locked his son up in a freaking dog, uh, dog house. Uh, but he, he was just fantastic. And then I had Joe Healy as my baseball coach, who was also my basketball coach. Okay. Uh, and again, another great mind. Uh, took everything very seriously, very intense. This really was. Okay. Uh, and and back then too, Ray, the coaches in Harrison, they were coaches for life. They were not good. Yeah, they, they, yeah, were, they were in the fly by nights. Unfortunately, like now, you get guys that are there one or two years. You know, no, you had coaches that were there for 10, 15 years. They, they treated it like they, you know, they were coaching for life. And that, that had to be rewarding for you, for you as an athlete growing up, knowing fully well that you were going to have those same guys for all four years. Elsewhere and stuff like that. It's just, you know, the coaches that our kids have now, the, 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 the recreation department is nowhere near where it was before. And I'm not knocking it, it's just not the same. Right. You know what I mean? Because all those guys who you mentioned, like, you know, we had, we had a guy, Richie Howell, he came from Carney to coach Harrison. Right. And he told me, he said, I've never seen anything like this before because it was one die, all die. You know what I mean? Like, even, they, even outside of practice, I had eight best friends. You mess with one, you mess with all. You got balled up. You mess and screwing around with Tim's Paris. <laughs> this is the way it was. Uh, and that was because of our coaching. Like, you know what I mean? You're a family. Right. Our t-shirts, the first t-shirt I ever got in high school, it said, it said three words. Hit, family. And then Harrison underneath. And that was our, that was our code, so to speak. We're going to hit you in the friggin' mouth. And we're going to protect each other like family. Okay. And that's because we come from Harrison. Okay. You know what I mean? Like, that was the message, so it, it was easy to follow, Jimmy, you know what I yeah. mean? Like, that was inbred since I was in Pop Warner. Okay. All right, so now, even though you're a 2,000-point scorer and a, and a first-team All-State player in basketball, you chose to go play football at Rutgers, and was it a tough decision for you, or was it always that you said, uh, you, you know, you wanted to play football more than anything else? No, it, it was definitely a difficult decision. When you get recruited by everybody in basketball as well, you know, when your first love is basketball, uh, for me, uh, I went to Virginia. It was a great visit. Like I told my dad, I, I want to sign. I think I want to sign with Virginia. And uh, he said no. And, and typically, of my dad is that you know, when you have responsibilities and you said yes to go other places, we're not making any decisions until you honor your word. Uh, which is, you know, my dad was teaching me lessons since I, you know, he teaches me lessons now, and I'm 47 years old. <laughs> But, uh, no, you don't tell anybody you're 47. I don't want to hear that yeah, number. That yeah, makes me, I'm, I'm seasoned, baby. That, doesn't, that, 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 that makes me feel like I'm ancient, brother. I don't, I don't, I don't want to know that you're 47. <laughs> in my eyes, you're still 17, 18 years old running around on the field. You know, that's what I want to hear. Yeah, but, you know, I remember coming home after my Syracuse visit, and it was for both basketball and football. And I remember getting off the jet that they said because I had a game on Friday night, so they threw me out on Friday night after the game was over, my basketball game, and there was four friggin' feet of snow on the ground. Oh. So I took one step off the friggin' the jet, and I said, hey, Pops, we can get back in this thing and go home. I ain't coming here. <laughs> I said, I ain't coming here. And the, and the best part was Donovan Pearson was the head coach at the time. Right. And he was like, listen, I guarantee you I'll be here four years with you. You saw what that Marvin Graves was there at the time. Yeah, that's some good. You saw what we did with him. Imagine what you could do with this offense. Yeah. So he 
you know, he said, don't make your decision now, go home. Two days later, he was the head coach of the Patriots. Yeah. So I was like, daddy, I'm not going to say it. This guy lied right into my face. Right. Yeah. Uh, when I got home, though, and I started reading the papers, and I started at seeing, you know, like I said, what Malika Jamil Jackson did, what Jake Bellamy did, uh, they started people staying home and trying to make their state great. And I thought it was a disservice to them, you know, and, and to like, you know, my, my class. Like, I mean, Mark of Attack, you know, from, you know, a different, like, New York City coming to Rutgers. Yep. I mean, we, we, we made the effort and committed to stay home and make the state great. Now, let me prerequisite that by saying this. If half these dumb, well, I mean, that's not the right word. If half of these kids would take pride in where they come from, we'd be in the top 25 at Rutgers every single year. Without question. Without a doubt in my mind. So, you know, for, for me, it was definitely one of the commitment. Yeah, but see, but, Ray, I don't want to interrupt, but the, but, the, but the majority of the kids, and especially for the last 25 years, the majority of the kids are now taught to uh, play high school football, but get out. Like, the goal is, like, okay, you want to get out of here and go away from here and get a chance to go away. And unfortunately, that's the mentality that a lot of people teach the kids, that are, especially the football players, to get out of New Jersey so they can go play football someplace else. And, and yeah. you know, well, it, that, that mentality doesn't help. It doesn't help at all, you know? Here's my answer to that, okay? I was 30 minutes away from home, and I was away at, away at school. Okay. All right. So I'll say it again. I was 30 minutes away from home, but I was still away at school. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter how far, what other state you go to. When you're at Rutgers, it's five campuses. It's huge. Yeah. You're away at school. You're Even taking a you're taking a shovel bus to get minutes. to class. You know? Yeah. You're freaking up. You're away at school. Yeah. We we got one of the greatest coaches that has ever coached at Rutgers and Greg Schiano back. Yeah. And you can damn sure put put a stamp on it. You can nail it. The football program in New Jersey at Rutgers University will be turned around because he's probably the only one, you know, that uh, restored greatness. I mean, I remember being in the league, and everybody used to try to bet me, but, you know, all the former guys before Greg were there. And then when we started kicking ass, I was like, what's the bet this week? Yeah, that's you right. Know what I'm because the pride that, that former players from Rutgers have is still there. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So once my boy got back, once Greg said yes, and there really wasn't anybody else for the job, Jimmy. I mean, no, really I don't think there. I don't think there could have been. No, there, there really wasn't. I mean, we made a lot of mistakes, and, and I'm not going to name names who I think the coaches that were garbage were. But again, since Greg left, it has never been the same. Uh, the discipline he instills in his players, the no nonsense about going into school, and let's face it. Rutgers academically is one of the top schools in the country, and they don't play games. Right. You know what I mean? So so I remember we had five-star recruits, me, Alcides, a whole bunch of guys, and two fell down this first semester. You want to know where they went? Oh. Nebraska. They won two state. They won two friggin' championships, and, and they graduated. They, got, they couldn't pass an exam. How do you go to Nebraska and graduate? Well, you know, we all know you that. Know how it happens? I'm not going to say that loud, but you understand what the hell's going on. Yeah, it's called special education as a my, as a major, you know? I, that's how it was. Jim, I'm not going to say that loud, but yeah. I'm saying, if you want somebody who cares about his players and cares about just not putting them on the field, but they do off the field, then you need to send your kids to Rutgers, plain and simple. Right. No, well, no question. But that was, go back to your recruiting. Um... They, you saw that there were a lot of the local guys were staying home and playing there, and I guess that's got to be a credit to Graber that he did a good job of keeping everybody to stay home. Man, right? Listen, Coach Graber was it was amazing, just an amazing man in, in itself. I, I'll never forget. This is the, the, the reason why I said I'm definitely going to Rutgers. We play on Thanksgiving, Jim. You know that every Thanksgiving. Every Thanksgiving we played North Darlington. Now, yep. I will I will say this: every time we played North Darlington Thanksgiving, you're conventionally in brawl. It didn't matter. <laughs> what the it was just a matter of when. Like if we were going to be up on them that much, they would start a fight. I will never forget. Early Thanksgiving morning, I'm inside the locker room, and my coach, my quarterback coach, Mr. Manning, comes out and he says, "Hey, somebody's out here to see you." And I'm like, "What?" I go outside. It's Doug Graber and his son on Thanksgiving. Wow. Wow. That's huge. That was huge, huge to me. So he went on the process and saying this. 
you're our guy. I am fully committed to you. Now, if you get hurt, then any sport you that is it. Well, I, you, oh, you didn't already commit to go to Rutgers before he was there that day? No, I wasn't. Oh, That's wow. The whole point. Like, as soon as I saw him at my game on Thanksgiving, like, Thanksgiving's a family day, like, yep. you know what I mean? And Harrison, yeah, Turkey Day is always uh, prerequisite by freaking, you know, us kicking NA's rear end in. All right. But the fact that he was there with his son, he brought his son. Wow. I said, man, this guy is the real deal. I I'm going to Rutgers, period. Okay. All right, well, and then you ended up, and, you know, there was nothing better than covering you in college. First of all, because you were definitely outspoken, so you were, from a sports writer standpoint, you were a great quote. And second of all, you all get, you gave me great quotes because you knew me before then. But, but so you always pull me over and give me, give me great stuff. But more importantly, from a sports writer standpoint, boy, oh, boy, was that team fun to watch. That was an absolute fun team to watch because you know why? You guys went up and down the field. And that offense was unstoppable. Non and I'm not saying it because I'm talking to you and you were the quarterback. If you, but if you look at the Big East standings, we're in the top five every single year I was there. Right. Hey, you had not easy to beat when you're playing in Miami, Virginia Tech, Boston College, West Virginia. Uh, you name it, we had one of the best conferences in football. Yeah. I mean, I agree. And your right, your and your backfield back then, Bruce Presley was the guy who was getting all the carries and getting all the glory. But but let's face facts: the guy who had the most amount of talent, the most amount of speed on that team was Terrell Willis. He was a stud. Well, well, here's the thing: we called him Thunder and Lightning for a freaking reason. Right. Because Bruce would struck you, run your. I mean, literally, physically, never shied away from contact. None. Uh, never got. Per Pushback and uh, Terrell Willis when he came in. I mean the speed. I mean I don't even know what he ran the forty. It was like low four threes, maybe four two eight. I don't yep. know. I mean you keep him a crease and he was gone. So you were looking at the back of his jersey for the rest of the afternoon. Uh, but Bruce, you know, and, and what do you do in the fourth quarter? You pound people when you're ahead. Yep. And that's when Bruce came into the mix and he physically harmed people when he ran. Right. And then you had three wide receivers that were really good. Like you said, Marco Pataglia was, was, was clearly the best tight end in the, in, in the Big East. Um, you, that offense was, was solid, top, top to bottom. It was, and it was fun to watch, like I said. Well, especially when I was younger. We had Chris Brantley. Yep. We played the league for a little while. And again, like, you know, when, when you had me talking about these guys, like Jimmy Garantano, who was yep. the most when I came on the visit, I mean, we're talking about two of the greatest wide receivers to play at Rutgers, and, and, and CB was just absolutely amazing work ethic. Uh, Jimmy, same thing, and they're not big receivers, dude. No. This is back in the day when you could be a little shorty uh, as a wide receiver, and we had a couple shorts. Well, that, well that's, be, that's because the quarterback was able to get out of the pocket and scramble and throw the ball on the run and find those little receivers. You know, they would find slots that just – you know, duck in and hide and bang, and you would throw, you know, get on a ball on a run and throw it to them. And you were, uh, yeah, that, I'm telling you, the two most, the, the two games I remember more than anything else was when you played Army up at Army, and I don't want to even know what that final score was, but I'm going to say like 51 49 or something like that. It was ridiculous. And then Virginia Tech at Virginia Tech, and that game, that game too was like 48 47. That game went up and down a few. Yep, I mean those uh, those are, those were great games, and I love and I love traveling to those games too. Even though I asked them to drive, like who in the world ever wants to go to to the Morgantown and to Blacksburg, Virginia, to go watch college football games? I mean Morgantown, West Virginia, or Blacksburg, those are de dead towns. But boy, oh boy, I'd say ah, oh, I'm going to cover Rutgers on Saturday. That was good, you know. Yeah, there was good times there. You know, I, I, I'm excited that my boy's back, Greg Chiano. He brought a lot of the old school guys back. Uh, I, there's a guy named Kevin McConnell. I know uh, Kevin very well. There. Yep. Uh, and he took very good care of me, especially when I just needed somebody to talk to. You know, what I mean, outside of football, J Mac was is is was and is one of the greatest men I've ever met. I mean, he's just that type of dude, and Greg brought him back. Yep. Uh, I mean, like I said before, Greg is going to turn this thing around. All right. And everyone has to be patient, but at the same time, we got the right man for the job. I mean, he's the real deal, no bar none. 
All right. Well, you got the, you got a, a great amount of faith because I don't know whether or not it can be ever done in the Big Ten, but that's besides the point. I think. Let me you know. tell you a story, Jimmy. It's right. going to be done. All right. I'm you right now, it's going to be done. I'll come back and I'll yeah, I'll come back and look for you when it happens. I'm telling you. Okay. I'm gonna call you. You got to call me. I'm gonna call you. All right. Even you better. Doubts. You it, had doubts, baby. I'm calling you. I have doubt. I have doubts, but that's besides the point. All right. So, what was that? What, what was it like to play at Rutgers? I mean, obviously. You you helped to put Rutgers back on the map. You made it, you know, you made it, uh, you made the teams much more uh, competitive. Uh, you you guys were w winning a winning team in in all four of your years. You uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You, you you went to two bowl games, right? As a player. We to, no, we we actually the funny part was my redshirt freshman year we were seven and four. And the committee, whoever the bowl game committee was, which I still don't like either one of them or whoever it was, and I'll still talk bad about them every chance I get, picked Oregon over us. Oh, man. Because of, of our fan base, which is a bunch of crap, if you ask me. But uh, that was the closest that we really came from going to a bowl game. Oh, you didn't uh, get to go to a bowl game? No, we didn't get to go. Oh, they, they, wow. They actually freaking picked somebody else, which was, which was disheartening, number one, because we put in the work. Um, but again, like I said, uh, Rutgers was awesome to be there, redshirted, to graduate from there. It's a great pride in my heart and my soul. Like I bleed scarlet, and, and it's never going to change. You know what I mean? It, right. It's just, you know, I'm ready for greatness to return. Okay. Greg is the man for the freaking job. All right. Now, you, if you graduated from college, did you know right away that you were going to get a shot to play in the NFL, or because no, you weren't you weren't drafted, so. Go ahead, tell us. Bob Winslow was their basketball coach. Yep. So he came to me after football season. It's like, I want you to come out for basketball. I was like, oh, my God, another dream come true. I can play in the Division One program for basketball. So I told him, hell, yeah, I'll come out. And then my mom calls me or pages me because, you know, back then we didn't even have freaking cell phones. Now nope. I'm myself again. Uh, and she says, you have a letter from the NFL. I was like, what? I'm coming home. I left school immediately. <laughs> I opened the letter up, and it was an invite to the combines. Wow. So, at the time, you know, I had no... And, and, I, I which, and which combine? Where were, you, where were you headed? In Indianapolis. Oh, wow. Okay. So, and, you know, up to that point, I didn't really think that, you know, because back then, don't forget, it was the Dan Marino, Troy Aikman, through Bledsoe years where they were drop back quarterbacks. That's not yep. what I did. You know what I mean? And no, you ran for your life. Stewart came on the field. Yeah, Cornell Stewart came on. Um, and uh, everybody was talking. Pittsburgh said they were going to draft me. Uh, but they took Derek Fisher from Duke. I outlasted him. I outlasted everybody who got drafted in my class. <laughs> That's for sure. So. All right. So what, so, you, so you, you went to the Combine. Did you think you were going to get drafted? Did you think you were going to have a chance? Yeah, from what the Combine told me. Yeah, okay. I definitely thought so. But here's the funniest thing. So at my house, you know, I, I'm a Harrison boy. We really didn't come from much. So my boys went to get the ticket. Like, you know, we didn't have cable. Like, we didn't have that stuff. So, you know, I couldn't watch it. Uh, and they were telling me, all right, this is the round. Like, they said probably sixth or seventh round that they were going to come get me Pittsburgh. Uh, I remember, the guy, I forget who the guy's name was from Pittsburgh. Because, you know, you go to a lot of meetings there. And he said, can you do what this guy does? I said, better. I'm better than what he can do. Okay. And, and then my boys told me, so I was, I was very hurt that I wasn't drafted. But, you know, people on the ESPN were saying it's three. There was only, I think, seven quarterbacks drafted, which is not really a lot. Okay. Seven, seven quarterbacks drafted in the whole draft? In the whole draft. Wow. And uh, me, Milanovic, and Tanny Hill from South Carolina were the three quarterbacks that everybody thought was going to go that didn't go. And then I remember after the draft was over, that was pretty salty. And, uh, you know, in the Harrison way, now it's about proving every single freaking person that didn't think I could play in the NFL wrong. Okay. So basically what happened was Jacksonville called me right after the draft was over with my agents at the time and said we wanted to come out for quarterback. And they, they, I think they were going to give me five grand. So my agent called me out and said, do the deal. But this, my agent at the time, which I'm not going to mention his name because it's a long time ago, this dumbass because they announced my name, Milanovic, and Tanny Hill's name on the air. Like, we're very shocked that they didn't get drafted. Try to hold out for a better deal, so to speak. So Jacksonville signed Tanny Hill, and I fired my agents that night. 
and I started making calls on all the people, the cards I got. Now, the first call I made was the window because Marcel's was there. He used to practice up at Rutgers Bubble. They didn't have a bubble back then. Right. And he's a Jersey boy, so I called New England myself, and, and I got Mike Cope on the line. I said, I need to talk to Bill Parcells. And he was like, who is this? And I'm like, Trey <laughs> Lucas. And Mike Cope being from, you know, this, this area when he was coaching with the Giants, right. said, hold on. So then Parcells comes on, and, and I can't say what he said on the phone, but it was more <laughs> or less, what the F do you want? Right. And I said, listen, all I need is a shot. Just give me a shot. I'll do anything. I'll play any position. I'll do anything. Let me show you what I bring to the table. So he put me on hold, which was like probably for 10 seconds, and it felt like 10 minutes. He said, all right, kid, send you a ticket. And I was like in total shock. So I think I had my phone to my ear even after he hung up because I was in total shock. So I go out for the mini camp. The first day, they got me as a wide receiver, which I've never played before. Never played before in your life, right? Yeah. I will say this. I caught every single ball. Okay. I didn't drop any. Uh, route running, probably now that I'm a quarterback, I understood uh, a little bit better as far as, you know, there's techniques to route running. <laughs> uh, and then the next, so I get on the bus. And that back then in New England, you had to drive to the facility. So I get on the bus, and Charlie Wentz comes to the door. He knocks on the window. And he's like, Lucas, off the bus. I'm like, oh, my God, they're cutting me right now. I don't even get the shower. Like, what kind of crap is this? And he said, Parcells wants you to ride with him. Wow. And I definitely needed to change my shorts after that. <laughs> because I was like, what? What do you mean he wants to talk to me? Like, I'm arguing with Charlie Wentz. He's like, man, I'm not arguing with you. Get to the car. So I get in the car with Parcells, and I am looking straight out the window. I'm not looking at him. I'm not even breathing. <laughs> so he says, hey, kid. We're going to move you to defensive back tomorrow. And I'm like, okay, another position I haven't played since high school. So Belichick, of course, is our D coordinator. Yep. And I might have got eight plays, and Belichick said, get the F out of here. <laughs> I was terrible. I was awful. Uh, and then the same thing. This, why, this time I get back further in the bus. Like, I, I went back three seats. Romeo Cornell comes to the window, knocks on the window. You, off the bus. I'm like, come on, man. This time I know I'm getting cut. I, and in my mind, Jim, I'm getting cut. So before training cut. camp? What? This is before training camp? Yeah, this is the mini camp. Like the oh, okay, the mini camp. camp. The rookie mini camp. All right. Yeah, so they bring back, you know, first, second year guys that are on the yeah. bubble. They bring on. So anyway, I get on the bus. I get on the bus. They pull me off the bus. This time I'm looking at him. And he's like, uh, when you're done showering, I want you to come see me. And I'm like, man. All right, so I go downstairs, Charlie, go upstairs. He said, listen, our quarterback that's coming tomorrow is not going to be here, so we want to see what you can do at quarterback. And a smile on my face. Marcel said, you could probably swallow your ears with that smile you got on your face. <laughs> so next day I go out. First pass I throw. Now, we're not even in helmets. It's a slant route. I throw it 800 miles an hour. It goes right through the kid's hands and breaks his nose. No, really? Oh, break his God. nose. And I, and Parcells looks at me and I'm smiling at him. Like, I told you. I told you. You know what I mean? So I did pretty decent. I threw the ball extremely hard as, as usually, like, you know, I could. And then I got the last friggin' thing on the bus. Once again, the knock comes. Right. Parcells wants you to ride with him again. And I'm like, oh, my God. So get in the car. He's talking to me a little bit. Like, Parcells likes to keep you in suspense. So he, he's giving me a little bit of stuff. He said, after you shower, I want you to come upstairs because now we're leaving. You know what I mean? Like, we're going home. And I'm in the shower for an hour. And probably more than an hour. And somebody comes down and says, what are you doing? I have, like, my, my fingertips are all raised, like that raisin type stuff. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. So it comes down, he goes, the guy goes, what, what, is, what are you doing? I go, I don't want to go up there. I don't want to hear the news. You know what I mean? Like, I, I just, and he's like, get the frig out of the shower, get dressed, and go upstairs. You're going to miss your flight. So even when he said that, I'm like, damn it, man, damn it. You know what I mean? Like, I'm going to let my whole family down. And, and at that point, it's the Harrison way that I represent Harrison, you know, while I'm out there. That, that's always been my, my thing. Like, it's not just about me or my parents. It's about Harrison. You right. You know what I mean? Like, one square mile of town, a kid can get out. Like, that was a message that was even going through my head at the time. So I go to Parcel's office, and he's like, what the F are you doing in the shower for so freaking long? I'm like, I just, 
didn't, I didn't want to come up here, coach. I'll be honest with you. So it's the first time I ever heard Parcells laugh. Probably the last time I ever heard. <laughs> uh, he says, "Listen, kid, uh, we want to keep you if you want to stay." And Jim, I swear to God, I must have said it 150 times. I want to keep you. I say, I want to keep you. I stay. And I had my eyes closed, I guess. And he goes, "Are you all right?" And I'm like, "What does that mean? What do you mean? What does that mean? What do you mean?" I'm not even making sense. <laughs> and he says, I'm going to give you a contract. You need to have your, your agent. I said, I don't have an agent. I'll sign it right now. He goes, no, no, you have to have, you know, like looked over and stuff like that. I said, I don't care what it says. I'm going to sign it right now. And he goes, are you a happy J.O.? I said, no, I'm not, but I want to sign right now. And he said, listen to me. I'm going to give you $3,000 to sign, which is more money than I've ever seen in my entire life. Right. And, uh, I said, okay, I'll take it home, but I'm, I'm just going to sign it when I get there and fax it back to you anyway. And he's like, I don't need to hear all this stuff. Just do what I say. So I said, when do I get the money? Then he really started laughing. <laughs> you know, that's the Harrison way. If you got money hanging around my head, give me the damn money. Yeah. Uh, I got a bag full of Patriot gear, and I stripped in his office and put the T-shirt on and the hat on. And I'll never forget this. So I'm going to the airport. I'm walking through, you know, the terminal and stuff, and, and the stewardess says, not the steward, the person that checks your ticket says, are you a patriot? Are you knowing a patriot? And, and I you said, yes, I am. hysterical crying. And I said, yes, I am. Yes, I am. So we fly back. I come out of the terminal, and there's 30 freaking people there. My parents, my family, my friends, they had signs, everything. Uh, and that was the beginning. Yeah. I mean, that, that was the start, you know what I mean? And, and I was going to play wide receiver. I wasn't even going to play quarterback. I, I had to say, I'm probably the only kid. You were playing special teams. NFL that played special teams and wide receiver for two years before coming to quarterback. Right. You were playing special teams at first. I remember that yeah, clearly. I was playing it well because I got to hit people. You know, yeah. Expensive. First time in your life. Hands on somebody. Yeah. You were, you were a hungry boy at that time. Starving. Yeah. <laughs> they, if they said you got to shine helmets at the pranks, I would have did it. Well, he well it paid off because Parcells loved you to death. Uh, you made the you made the Patriots, and then when Parcells after a year with you and him there, he took the job with the Jets, and I don't think there was any thought process at all. You were going to go with him, weren't you? Well, I, I, I have no idea because you know when Pete Carroll came in, and it's kind of fun. Uh, when Pete Carroll came in, I'm used to Bill Parcells was training camp where it's three days. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. He said that constantly. Right. There's no light. You didn't even know what freaking day. It was like we were in coronavirus. You didn't even know what day it was right. because it was football all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and when, and by the time it was time to go Pete home, Carroll you were exhausted. We were, yeah, when Pete Carroll got there. We were going home. We were doing all kinds of stuff. I didn't even know it was allowed in the <laughs> And then he brought me in. And he said, you're just not good enough to play in the NFL. Wow. And he put his hand out. And my dad told me something when I was very young. He said, uh, if you ever want to disrespect somebody, you spit on them. Like, that's the biggest form of disrespect that my father told me when I was young. Anybody ever spits on you, he better not be walking. So I had thought about spitting in his hand. But, you know, my father being a Navy man, I'm bored up on respect. So I never called coaches by the first name. I said, hey, Pete, I'll see you soon. Now, okay. we just had Raven, me and my wife. Uh, and she was living in Jersey while I was living in New England. And we just got, got married. And she drove up. She had a better job than me in the city. She was making more money than I was in the NFL. And when I got cut. See, she was making more money than you, Mary? Yeah, she, yeah. Was, she was working in the city. She was an uh, assistant to an executive in a printing company. Okay. And, uh. I remember the next day after I got cut. So I, I was kind of down to my sorrows. I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, in my apartment. And uh, 6 o'clock in the morning, the phone rings. So you know how I am. You know how angry I can be. Right. I, mean, I, I was born angry. I think I came out of womb angry. <laughs> so I said, who the F is this? And he said, man, what the F is going on down there? And I put my hand on the, the, the speaker part of the phone. I'm like, it's Marcellus, it's Marcellus. And I said, Coach, I don't know, man. It's just not, it's just not you. It's just not you. And he said, I have a ticket in, at Providence Airport. He said, you miss it and don't even bother coming. Now, I had two hours to get to the airport. 
Now, I don't have to tell you the traffic on 95 at any given time. At any time, right. I put my little angel, Raven, in the back seat in the car, strapped her in, and took the shoulder at 90 miles an hour. Oh, no. <laughs> now, here's the best part. So he says, I want two pairs of shorts, two pairs of shirts, two pairs of socks and sneakers to get here fast. Make the flight, get to the thing. The guy's there to pick me up at the airport. It was, I think, a Wednesday or something. And uh, I'm driving in. There's four buses inside uh, Hofstra University. They're going to play Tampa Bay. Okay. Everybody's in a suit, Jim. You know, you travel, it's business. Uh, here I am in shorts and a t-shirt, and he's like, get on the bus. I go, get on the bus? Where am I going? He goes, we got a game. We, you got to go. Let's go get on the bus. I go, coach, everybody's dressed. Because I don't give a shit. Get on the bus. Needless to say, put me on every special team. I was hot garbage because I didn't know the scheme of anything. I almost got DJ Paul or killed twice. <laughs> uh, what number did they give you to, practice, to play in in that game? At that time. Time, I think I was 18. 18, okay. And then, uh, you know, for, for the beginning of that year, I was in the Southern practice squad for a little bit. Then, you know, I, I do remember early on being pulled up from the thing. Now, the best part about the whole scenario is when we were in New England, we went to the Super Bowl, we played Pittsburgh. Right. They had Cordell Stewart. So Belichick comes to me and says, I need you to be Stewart. He said, I need you to make them work. Right, in the, so for the, the scout team, team. right. The light went on in my head saying, this is my shot to show everyone that I am a quarterback, not a wide receiver, a special team scout. I made the freaking defense look so bad on Wednesday that Belichick made it come in at 6 o'clock in the morning on Thursday. So I remember like the second play, quarterbacks don't get hit even from scout team. Right. I carry out a fake and Willie McGinnis launches me six yards in the air. Oh, God. So I get up, and in typical Harrison Ford and fashion, I said, is that how it's going to be? Is that how I, and I said a lot of, you know, cursive words? In it. Yep. I said, okay, okay, Biox, it's on. Uh, made a couple, you know, Thursday was kind of the same thing, and I remember us meeting them in, I think the, no, it was the, the game before the NC Championship game, and Cordell Stewart did nothing. Yep. And I'll never Zero. forget Belichick yep. coming over to my locker. And thanking me, he said, you have a lot to do with this now. Really? Go and that says a lot for him to, to give you credit. That, yeah. That's not Belichick, you know that. That's yeah. not him. No way. Uh, and then after I came to the Jets, and then I really, I started playing quarterback, uh, Parcells brought in nine guys to, for me to compete against. Yep. I just kept, taking kept them beating down, them all. Taking them down. I think Dan Henning, my quarterback's coach, who was a Boston College coach when I was at Rutgers, yep. had a lot to do with it. Uh, he trusted me. He loved you too. He did. Yeah, yeah. He trusted me and I trusted him. And the next thing you know, here's the second funniest story that I could ever tell you that has no expected in center. So now I'm officially a quarterback, right? <laughs> so when you're a quarterback, which I didn't know, usually when you're not a quarterback, you have two people in your room. You bunk with somebody, right? Right. All right. So I get to my room, I open the door, and there's a single bed in there. So I put my bag in the door to keep it open. I pull the front desk. I go, you got a major mistake on your hands. I said, I am not sharing one bed with another man. <laughs> what I didn't know was then he was hiding in the doorway. And then I hear him laughing. And I hang up on the lady in the thing. And she, he said, who? I go, what? I go, what are you laughing at? Like, I was hot. And he said, you're a quarterback now, dude. There are no roommates when you're a quarterback. And I said, I like this quarterback. Yeah, said, I'll take that right. job. Yeah. He said, you have to concentrate. You have to go over the game plan. You need complete silence. You have to dial in. And Vinny, Vinny Festiverde had a lot to do with me becoming the quarterback that I became because of his work ethic, because of his, you know, studying, because the long hours. Like, he taught me all that stuff. He taught me how to eat. He taught me how to lift. Like, we would battle in the weight room. Me and him, and he was one of the strongest individuals I've ever seen in, on the on the planet. Everybody has always of, said he's a great runs. teammate. He's unbelievable. Yeah. He's a great, one of the greatest yep. I, I have ever kind of met as far as players go. And yep. I, you know, I know Q because Quebec, you know, it was Jersey boy. I mean, that's right. what I'm saying. Foley, the yep. number one Jersey boy. You know what I mean? But Testa Verde showed me how to be a professional because you know me if I lost I didn't want to talk to the media I would tell him scratch yeah. he said that's not you're not being professional you need to be professional and I was, I was completely blown away stand in front of the locker every day be accountable 
That was the most important. That was what Vinny Tessaverde used to always say. Stand in front of the locker and be accountable. That's it. Yeah. So here we are. Right, fast forward. Vinny is killing it. And he blows his Achilles out. First game. Yep. And I wasn't even dressed. I had a fist fight with Maurice Carthon because I was leaving. I was not going to stand on the sideline street clothes. This just wasn't in my, it's not my DNA. Okay. And Vinny came to me and he said, I need you on the sidelines. You got to be in my eyes. And then it was over. As soon as he said that to me, I was like, for him, I'll do anything. Yeah. Anyway, blows out his Achilles. My first game is against Indianapolis Colts. We lose because I throw a pick because I was great. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we go Monday night to New England. To the guy who said I couldn't play. Couldn't play in the game. Well. Yep. And the last person, like, you know, I did interviews, and I think we ripped their ass apart, the Patriots. And I kept trying to get to the sidelines. So finally I shake Penny Bruschi. I get to the sidelines, and I said, and I can't, again, say it in the, in the form I want to, Jimmy. Right. I said, how about now, MF? Mm -hmm. How about now? Can I play now? And, like, all my boys were like, push my guy here, look, get out of here, look. But I got what I wanted to say. Yep. So at the end of the thing, Leslie Bisser comes, she interviews, interviews me on the sideline. I got to run to the locker room, and I see this, this, you know, like a, a, a how do I say, a figure. It was freaking, and Parcells never takes uh, hurt individuals on trips. Right. I begged him to have Vinny come out because I needed him there. Yeah. And the last person who waited for me to come off the field was Vinny Testaverde. Oh, my God, really? And he hugged me. Cried, and uh, it was it was you know what I'm saying like something like that. That's that's how Vinny is. He's just genuinely a special person in my yep. heart. He always will be. I've I, everybody I've ever interviewed, they all say that the best teammate they ever played with was Vinny Testaverde. They say they all everybody says that they were, they were the best teammate they ever played with. Just, just he was a great man. Yeah, just yeah. a great man. So, all right. So, anyways, what so. What was that like to be, you know, now you're playing for the Jets, you're back home, um, you know, everybody's, you know, like I, I would imagine you must have been getting besieged with ticket requests. I mean, you know, like what what, what was that like to be now back in uh, back in New Jersey and playing for the Jets? You can't even put it into words because my family, my friends, my every, everyone, everyone came to watch me play. I mean, there was 30 people at every single game, which – Probably made me broke because I still wasn't making that much money. In the United <laughs> United so uh, at first I was paying for all that. I was like, "This guy stop!" I mean, you want to come to the game? I'll get you tickets, but I ain't paying for it. <laughs> don't rate me. Right. It's not happening. Uh, it, I, I don't even know if I can put it into words, Jim. You know what I mean? Like to be literally walking distance from my town to the stadium that my father was a Giants season ticket holder. Yep. Uh, and see people with the Lucas jerseys on it. That was amazing. It was absolutely That was amazing. Fulfilling. To see I so many that. people wearing a number six jersey. And, and it, yeah, it, I, never, I never want I actually, I, I thank you because I did get to pick my own jersey. I was going to pick number one, but I knew if I picked number one, like Omar College, that Marcel's be riding my ass. <laughs> I figured I'd take the day, the number of my birthday, which is the six, August 6th, so I, I wore that one. Okay. Uh, but. But then, if you picked if you picked one, if you picked one, Parcells would have rode your hiney and, and he'd be, all he would all day every day. Would, and and the sarcastic, come on, one, what's the, well, you know, what are you, are you come on, number one. Yeah. And it would have been something else. Yeah. Get that number one. Give him a red jersey with no number on. He would say something like that. But sarcastic would come on, number one. I can hear that. I can hear it right now in his voice. Oh, yeah. Just like the second just like the way he rode he rode Sims every he rode yeah. Sims like a pony. Second greatest man in my lifetime that I have ever met is Bill Parcells. Mm -hmm. He's right behind my dad. Yep. And there are a lot of people that say bad things about Bill Parcells, and I'm not one of them. He treated well. They better not say it around me because they're going to get their heads split. Why yeah. Well, he he treated me with such incredible respect that I can't. You know, I think he liked the fact that I was big. So he always, you know, like, he goes, he'd always, if I was walking ahead of him, he goes, says, I'm going to follow him because he's going to lead the block. And I said, I'll do, I'll lead, I'll lead the blocker for you, coach, any day. I'll lead the blocker for you. I mean, yeah, anybody ever says something about him around me, it's going to be a problem. Yeah. All right. So then, uh, towards the end, now you were with the Jets for what, four years? Yeah. Yeah. All right. And then, how did the Dolphins come into the picture? Well, ourselves, I was. 
it's the only time my coach and, and you know, the second greatest man in my life ever lied to me because everything he said, I could put a stamp on it and send it, and it would have been true. Uh, he said if I played well that year, that I would be taken care of with a contract. And, you know, it, it was kind of weird because he was very close to my wife and, and my daughter, Raven, who was the baby. She's not 25. Like, he used to bring her lunchboxes full of candy outside. Okay. Uh, and he promised me that he was going to take care of me after the thing was over with. So after that season, when we become 8-8, eight and eight, he leaves. He's going to the front office. And we're in contract negotiations. Uh, numbers that, and it wasn't, you know, huge, you know what I'm saying? They weren't huge numbers, but they were huge to me because I've never seen any type of money like that ever. Right. You know I mean, not even on TV. Like, you know, like for me, it, it was my reward, so to speak. And then I remember my wife was pregnant with her second child, so she, she actually, my wife's tiny, she lost 30 pounds in her pregnancy, so she was on bed rest. Wow. In the hospital. And I had Raven at home, and back in the day, remember we had the caller IDs? Yep, of course. So I, I'm watching the draft, and I see New York Jets pop up. And then I see it pop up again. Both times I don't answer it. I call my agent. I'm like, you better call them and find out what the hell is going on. What are they doing? Call me on draft day. And then I heard it. With the up team pick in the first round, the Jets select Chad Pennington. Chad Pennington. And I said, Martha, you know what? Yep. And then uh, I took the baby. My, my little angel, I took her to my mother-in-law's house because it was now bar time for me. Uh, my agent called me back and said, ready, the contract negotiations are over. So basically, they drafted Chad, he got my money, and that was that. Mm -hmm. So I didn't speak to Parcells for months. Months. Like, I wouldn't even talk to him. He tried to talk to me, I wouldn't even say anything. So me and Benny are working out in the weight room one day. And he comes up and tries his stuff, like, oh, this little girl doesn't want to talk to me. I said, I will take this 20-pound dumbbell and split your weight. I said, get away from me. Get away from me. So the one day, my wife is supposed to come to practice, and I'm looking for her because, you know, she's pregnant. Yep. So I'm trying to look for her. It's like towards the end of practice. I'm like, oh, my God, like, should I be panicking? I'm supposed to be practicing. I'm worrying about where she is. And then she's on the field. I'm like, I mouth her. I'm going to kill you. You know what I mean? Because I'm, I can't, I'm practicing. I can't be worrying about where you're at. Right. And she's like, just relax, just relax. I said, don't tell me to relax. Uh, she was upstairs talking to Parcells the whole time. Oh, you're kidding? Mm. No. So, I mean, our relationship now is it, better. I, I talk to him at least once a month. Uh, you know, he, he tried to use that term like he always used. I was trying to teach him. Does he live in New Jersey again? Does he live down the shore? No, uh, he, 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 he spends his time down the down in Florida and, and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, you know, he, he he's he's earned it. He earned it. Absolutely. Or whatever. Yep. Uh, but it, it hurt my soul when he did that to me. You know what yeah. Because I mean? he was he was kind of the only person in my whole career that never lied to me except for that one time. Mm -hmm. But that being said, you know, I, I I can't forget everything that that man has done for me. Of course. I can't forget that, you know what I mean? It's like he, he was, he's just, he's just a great, I wasn't supposed to play a day in the NFL. Right. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have played a day in the NFL, you right. know what I mean? Right. You got, and, you, and you got the pension out of it, you got six years, and you, and, you eight know. Eight years, brother. Eight years. Eight years. I apologize. Yeah. God. Yeah, see? All right. See? I'm shortchanging you a little bit. So, all right. So then the last stop was the Dolphins, and that was just, you know. No, that wasn't even the last stop. I went to the Ravens for a cup of coffee for seven weeks. Oh, did you really? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, but I went to the Dolphins because I was a restricted free agent. Yep. Uh, I, had a, I had a fight with uh, Terry Bradway. Because once I went to Miami and they made the offer, I was taken no matter what. And uh, I remember going back to say goodbye to the secretaries and everybody and telling everybody thank you. And me and Terry Bradway met in the hallway. And he's like, you understand why I didn't? You know, say we weren't going to match a deal right away because, you know, if, if Chad or Vinny got in a car accident, we would have had to keep going. I said, what did you just say? <laughs> we almost fought in the hallway. I said, if you ever talk about my friends like that dying in the car crash again, I said, do me a favor. All your jersey privileges are revoked. Mm. And they literally had to come out and separate us. And this wow. is when Herm was there by the time. So, okay. Uh, me and Terry now are super straight. But again, you know, business is business. I agree. It's not good with business like that. Especially when you talk about my friends. Yep. I'm just, I, 
you know, business goes out the window with me, Jim. But you talk about somebody that people that I care about, that, you know, you better have your hands up because you might get punched in the face. <laughs> but, you know, I went, uh, Rick Spielman, who is a, another brilliant man, uh, he goes, you're either taking the offer or when you leave, it's rescinded. I thought that was very good business technique. So I called White and said, I'm signing this bad boy yep. right away. Uh, and that was it. Then I, you know, I played for the Dolphins. I had one bad game, like a really bad game against Buffalo, but I was playing with a separated shoulder and uh, uh, a broken clavicle. And I, I took medicine at halftime. You know, it, it, it was just not a good game. I took four picks in the second half. Yeah. Uh, I went in front of the media and said for the first time in NFL history, one man lost the game for 52 other men. Don't look at the coaches. Don't look at anybody else. It's all my fault. And the reason why I said that was because I wasn't strong enough to say, no, I can't play. Yeah. You know what I mean? Another lesson learned in the NFL. But you were hurt bad, though, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. I went yeah. to see Dr. Andrews as soon as the season was over. Yeah. And no, and I hate to say, but and Miami is when when the, your problems start to begin too, right? Yeah, well, I I, I blew my back out when I was with the Jets. Uh, I was I was hand cleaning four hundred pounds. Okay. Uh, the first one rep went so easily that there were you know we we maxed out dates, so and everybody's yelling, "Look, do another one, do another one." As I pulled my second rep, the leather strap broke, so one went one way, and I was pulling the other way. Two pops took my breath away. And uh, I had herniations inverted into my spinal column. Oh, God. So they basically said to me, you have two choices. One, you get the surgery, you'll never play again. Two, you could rehab this injury, but if they hit you hard enough, you could be paralyzed. I said, okay, we're going number two. It wasn't even a thought in my mind. Right. Like, if I got paralyzed while I was playing, you know, you sign up for something in the NFL, Jimmy. You know, there's always a risk that you're really going to get physically hurt. Amen. Amen. And, you uh, never, you, and you never know. That, you never know. I was willing to take that risk of being paralyzed. Like, that's the mentality of a football player. Right. Like, it would have been okay for me to get paralyzed on, on on the field. You know what I'm saying? My daddy told me one thing. He said, I don't care how hurt you are. You walk off the field. because I don't care if you collapse on the sideline. because you may never get another chance to walk off the field again. Yep. Yeah, good point. You know what I mean? So I, I was, I, I had that mentality. I had the Harrison mentality that I am tougher than any injury I could possibly have. Okay. Which is kind of stupid afterthought. Now I'm thinking about it, but I had another incident when I was with the Ravens. Uh, kind of sneeze, lost feeling from the waist down. Really? And, uh, yeah, and I said to myself, you know, I you think sneezed. I sneezed. You sneezed, sneezed and, said, and you lost feeling from the waist down. Wow. Collapsed. I said, God, please. Do not do this to me. Like, I can deal with being paralyzed during a game. I cannot explain a sneeze to everybody. That's how I got paralyzed. I said, I just might as well just kill myself right now. Because that would be more embarrassing. Not the fact that I was playing with a back I should have been playing with. Right. But the fact I sneezed and lost it from the waist down. Uh, but I got And what did, the doc what did the doctor say that caused that? Well, it was the same issue. Same issue. You okay. Know, it's the same issue. And uh, I remember going home that night after getting feeling back in my legs. And I said... You know, I have beautiful doors. Uh, three beautiful doors. Do I want to roll them down the aisle or do I want to walk them down the aisle? And that's when I came. I guess my coming to Jesus moment was like, you know what? This is not worth me not being around for my kids or not being fully functional. And that's when I decided to retire. Okay. Well, all right. Now, at that time, Ray, did you have any idea that you wanted to get into broadcasting or was that yeah. maybe... Zero, right? Zero. Okay. Now, how does that happen real quick? Uh, well, how did... yeah. well, here's the thing, Jim, and I'll make it quick. Uh, you know when you lose the game, like you have to retire because you're injured, it's not on your terms. So I was struggling mentally very okay. much so that I couldn't do something I've been doing my whole life. That was that was, that was was my whole world. You know what I'm saying? Like, that was my job, but it was something I loved to do. And I was struggling at home, like a lot of you. I started getting depressed. Uh, it, it was a bad time for me. And then I remember he just being called and said, hey, we want you to come on cold pizza. Okay. And I didn't even care about the money. I didn't even ask. I didn't care. I thought if I could talk about football, maybe this will get me out of my funk. And I remember the first time I did, uh, you know, ESPN's cold pizza, it was me and Hal 
Howard Cross, Goose. I call him Goose. Like he's like from Top Gun. I call him right. Goose. Right. Okay. Uh, he, when I started talking about football, Jim, I was better. I was still part of the game. Okay. I was still talking about the game I love. I had knowledge, being that I'm a quarterback, that nobody else has the knowledge of knowing or seeing what I see when I watch a game. And it saved my life, to be honest with you. Wow, okay. Did and you? then once I started doing, doing it, like, you know, Pernetti was at CSTV at the time, and then I started calling games. But, you know, like anything else you got to pay your dues. I remember flying four hours and then driving three hours with my bad back. I said, at this, I can't do this. I, I physically can't do it. Yeah. Uh, and then SNY started their network, and they called me, and I said, you know what? Love it. Yeah. Talking about the Jets, I'm home. It's my home team. You know, and, and it was just uh, doing doing broadcasting was not foreseen. I wanted to be an FBI, a marshal. I wanted to be one of those people. You know what I mean? That was my dream. That's why I graduated Rutgers. Okay. Uh, but my my wife always told me, how are you supposed to go to college? See, there's something I never knew about you. Thing here, yeah, man, I wanted to be an FBI agent, Secret Service, you know, anything like that. But, you know, my wife was like, no, because your kids want to cover. They're going to know who you are and you're going to get killed. You know, she went on yeah. the tangent. But at the same time, you know, working for <clears throat> SMI for 14 years, which has come to an end this year. It has come uh, to an end? Yeah, man. You know, you know, money is always the issue and everything. Coronavirus is not a great time to be negotiating. But after 14 years... You could also a 0.8 percent raise. It was just time for me to walk away. I love the people I I work with there. I made long. I don't think anybody knows that. That hasn't been reported anywhere, right? You're the first person. I say say some of the good stuff for people that I know. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. I don't like hearing those words because you know you became really really popular on that show. You were the only one that you you know how they always say you know like you only say you only say shit if you got a mouth full of it. No, you're yeah. you're quite the opposite. You you definitely say it. So well, well here, here's the difference, Jimmy, and, and you're a Jersey boy. You know what I'm saying? We we don't know how to lie. I call it the way I see it. Yeah. Like will say you play great. You play like crap. We'll say you play like crap. Uh, but yeah, it, it was just time to walk away. Uh, yeah, on good terms, was I disappointed? Yeah, of course I was. And yeah. Me being there when the thing started 14 years ago, and then, you know, and, and I get it, dude. I, I do understand coronavirus. I mean, I'm executive director of the housing in my hometown. So right. I, I do know a lot of people don't have jobs. I, I get all that stuff. But, I, you know, I'm a guy that's big on loyalty. You know, my father being a Navy man and, you know, a veteran, Loyalty in, in your word is it's something that means something to me. And that was, you know, my dad instilled that in me. You know, you, you have to have loyalty. You have nothing. Right. Good and, point. And I, I didn't feel the loyalty. And I didn't feel the offer that I was made was respectful in any way, shape, or form. I thought, actually, thought it was disrespectful. Okay. All right. So, but, but again, like I said, I, I, I don't look at this as a loss, Jimmy. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I got years to work with some of the greatest people that I've ever met and and, and I respect uh, you know some of them I don't respect I'm going to be honest with you but okay. you know the majority of the people I work with Jim were absolutely top notch okay. and I mean from people helping me like you know we had a girl Timmy helping me with cutting my stuff or my, my breakdowns I work with Bart Scott awesome dude I work with Willie Cologne another awesome oh. dude Eric Coleman awesome dude yep. Brian Custer who shaped my 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 broadcasting career because he took such an interest in me and wanted me to be great. Okay. You know what I mean? I mean, it, these are the people that molded me, great producers. You know, I, I mean, I, I mean, my producer now, Gus, and that's why I, I think I'm going to miss the most. I mean, Janae Copley. I mean, can you get any better than no, Janae no, you know what I'm no, saying? no. She's, she's, she's a, I mean, just I work with great people. Dude. I don't regret my time at SNY. It actually made me a better person. So it's just I'm just disappointed that I couldn't get 15. In, you know what I mean? Yeah. I thought that was going to be the be the thing. But it, well, I think everybody's my, disappointed my about that, right? Everybody's disappointed about that because you were you were the the one beaming light that uh, that everybody wanted to turn on and listen to because you were not afraid to speak your mind. And, uh, well, and you, you will be the first one, Jimmy, to tell it to the world because nobody. Knows. Yeah, all right. Well, that's uh, that's a shame, but you know who knows if there's going to be a football season anyway. So you know, and that, well, that's like the sad thing. It'd be dumb if they don't push it to the spring. I mean, I agree. Else, I, mean, I that's where I think we're going. Too, Jimmy. Yeah. You're talking about a four billion dollar a year business. Yeah. Talk about the NFL. You're talking about fifteen billion dollars. 
Yep. You know what I mean? That's teacher salaries. That's, you know, other programs, sports programs in the university. So I don't understand what they're trying to press. But we have to err on the side of, of life beats more than, than the game. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I think that's the way we're going to go. I, I said to a lot of people that there's certainly the sport of football cannot be played on any level. High school, college, football, you know, college. Smash somebody and sweat goes in your eyes. Yep. And spit. And I don't want to say this and sound like a jerk, but you know how many times I spit it on somebody on the bottom of a pile? Me too. Me, <laughs> me too. Happens, dude. I know. I want. I once had a guy try to take his eye. He had his finger in in between the cage and was trying to gouge out my eye. And I said, "You got to stop doing that right now, or I'm going to kill you." You know, like oh, I, that, you know. that's funny because we had that every single time we played North Island. So yes. That, that <laughs> so, but but that idea alone, I I firmly believe that we're not going to play football on any level, high school, college, pro, at all in the fall. until we get a vaccine. I don't see it happening. Well, here's yeah. my thing. I'm executive director, right? Yep. Like my house. Yep. Right. I don't sleep at night because I worry about my staff. I, I have people who have the coronavirus in my apartments that, you know, my guys have to go in, of course, has and suit up. But why put people at risk? I mean, this thing is killing people. Too. Yep, absolutely. It's killing people. You know what I mean? It's not something that we need to play with right now until we have some semblance of normalcy. Right. I mean, and, and that's how I feel about it. I mean, I, I worry about my staff. I worry about my tenants. You know what I mean? Like, this is this is a serious thing. Like, I got stomach problems for the last two months, three months because of this stuff. Right. It's just, you know, the stress of making sure that my my staff goes home and they're safe when they go home. You know, they all have families, Jimmy. And, and now I know exactly what Parcells felt like. Yep. You know, what? because he did give a shit about every single person that played for him. And he did care about their families. And he did care about, I never forget it. The first time he saw me, I had my two earrings in. He's like, what is that crap? <laughs> <laughs> I said, hey, coach, man, what you see is what you get. Yep. He's, so. He once said that to somebody because he says, until your name is Lawrence Taylor, don't come walking at me with jewelry in your head. I remember. Unless, unless oh your name God. is Lawrence Taylor. Yep. He can, yeah, but like I said, listen, Dan Hannings of the world, Charlie Weiss, Bill Parcells. I mean, I, I got... I got friends like Zach Thomas, is still a good friend of mine. Uh, Richie Anderson, Corbett. I mean, I, I have people that I love and yep. that I played with. You know what I mean? That, that relationship is uh, like Richie Anderson. I mean, how about a guy that takes you in because you know I'm not making that much money, and so I don't have to pay rent. I get to move into his apartment. Not bad. You know what I mean? And Richie Anderson played at Penn State, so you know I had reservations about that. Yeah, by the way, you had to worry about that. Yeah, yeah I had to worry because yeah. they beat our ass every, every year. Play them Every like year, like and every year, that was horrible. And then, and then from my standpoint, as a sports writer, having to drive, leave the house at six six thirty in the morning to make that drive out to Happy Valley to see you guys get beat. No, that was not fun. That was not. Fun. Well, how about you know when you had six traffic in the first round? How about freaking playing a team like that? Yeah, it's horrible. I believe so. All right. So anyway, uh, but you know, you will return. As the radio voice at Rutgers, because that's your pride and joy, and you're not doing that to get rich. You're doing that because you just love Rutgers football, and you do it. Well, obviously, I haven't right. gotten a raise there in like six years. Well, I got to worry about paying fruits. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, that's where all the money goes. Well, it's exactly. You know, but Fucciarelli is the one that, you know. Yeah, if you, if you, he's the one well, that's the has got to take a nice little piece. Yeah, yeah, but now he's but now Collins making the big bucks, so you don't have to worry about that anymore. You know, he well, he played he played the game well. He played the game well. He played. Yeah, he 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 played the game well. He got rid of he got rid of FAN and he went right to ESPN, and now he's making the big bucks. Listen, let me tell you a short story. Chris Carlin is uh, probably one of the best broadcasters I've ever been with, I, I still have problems thinking in my head how this dude is not on CBS. Yeah. I mean, he's that good, Jimmy. He's that good. And don't think I don't watch college football, because I do. And I can tell you this, they can't hold a candle to my boy. I agree. Not even a freaking candle. I, I, Chris I, I, I agree. I agree. Yeah, he does. You know what's going to happen? I'm going to win the lottery one day. I'm going to buy something. I'm just going to put all the people I like in, in business. That's it. You know what? That would not be a bad deal. Cause you know what, you got a lot of people. You got a lot of people that like you, and you get and you, and you got a lot of people that that, that you like. So that's you know. Yeah, so Bruce you know. Beck, you, Bruce Beck, oh. Carlin, you're all coming. 
All right, I'm in. I'm, I don't even. I don't even need a contract, Ray. I would just. I'll just. I will just walk right along. Whatever you say, I'm all for. So. All right. Anyway, before we before we say goodbye, uh, let's 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 talk about the most important things in your life, and that obviously other than your mother and your father. But uh, let's talk a little bit about CC. Who CC is the reason why this happens today. Oh, it's Sessie? Yeah, she says yeah, yeah. We just we shortened it up to Sessie. And I've been calling her Cece for God knows how long. Yeah, she, she don't. She don't care. Parcells has been calling Cece since he's known her. So I mean, you, you just can't. Like I'm like, coach, how many freaking times I got to tell you, Sessie? Right. And well, I apologize. Like, I will Cece, now. Yeah, All right. Well, please, I will now have to tell her that I've been selling yeah, saying her name wrong for the longest. I don't know for how 25 years. All right. But she's the reason why this. is this took place because she, I could, every time I'd see her on Facebook and I'd say, now, Ceci, remind Raymond if he, when he's ready to do my podcast, she goes, okay, no problem. Well, boom, yesterday, she says, all right, he's ready to do it when you're ready. I said, I'm ready. Whenever he says, I'm ready to do it. So, and then, uh, and then your three beautiful daughters and, and give, and it made me feel about 107 that, uh, that Raymond's now 25 because I remember her from playing. All right, and how is she doing, and how is... I, I, I got to tell you something, Jimmy, you know, I, I've done a lot of things, I've accomplished a lot of things in, in my lifetime, and, and I've done a lot of stupid things, and, and you know, I'm, that I'm not proud of and stuff like that, but there's been one constant in my life since I was in high school, and that's my wife. Right. You know what I mean? And she's a ride or die chick, you know what I mean? Don't get her cute, sexy demeanor, let it fool you, because she will bust you to the white meat. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, so what's Raven doing? What's Raven doing now? And I know Raven Kayla just. Now, an exec, she works, she's an executive assistant in structure tone in the city. Okay. Uh, she graduated from Montclair State. My middle child, who was signed with Mel Wilhelmina, she's a model and she goes to LIM, the fashion school in uh, New York. Okay. And my little angel, Kayla. Rain, uh, she actually graduated this year. Right. And she's going to Pace University. She's going to be Dr. Kayla Lucas. She wants to be a forensic scientist. Beautiful. She, yeah, she, I don't know where to get the brains from, Jim, because it damn sure ain't from me. That's for damn sure. We know that. Yeah, for just, that huh? I've been hit too many times on the head. <laughs> but I felt bad for Kayla and the fact that she got hurt um, right at the end of the basketball season. And, uh, she had a severe concussion, and I had a higher unit. Now yeah. You tell me that's not my kid. Right. Yes. She's like, no, I'll just bring the uniform and I'll stand on the side. And I go, yeah, okay, I already hit it already. Yeah. Yep. And all she said was, I can't wait to get back so I can play softball. And then, of course, we all, as we all know, the Heart softball season, the all se softball season didn't happen. Couldn't walk during graduation. I mean, you know what? I don't. I don't really think people realize. The effect, you know, you, they call it a, uh, an elderly disease, this coronavirus, and it's nothing, that's not true at all. Not at all, no. You know what I mean? But the, what what has happened is our kids have suffered with the no graduation, and it's just, it's just so difficult, Jimmy, you know yeah. what I mean, for kids, and, and to see my daughter in her room for a very long period of time, and, and you know that there's really nothing you can say to, to help her, it, it's the most frustrating thing as a father to not take the pain away from kids like I would lay down in the street for all four of my women yep but when you can't do anything it's so frustrating I hear you all right so the one last thing and we're going to talk about your loyalty to Harrison 
that when you first started playing pro football, you lived in Jackson, down in down in South Jersey, and then all of a sudden you made the decision, and you said to Ceci, uh, I want to go home, and I want to raise my daughters uh, in the same town that I grew up in. How important was that for you to make that move? And in retrospect now, you, your three daughters have all graduated from Harrison High, like just like you. And well, okay, here's the funny thing. And again, like I said, when I talk, I'm not trying to disrespect Jackson or anything like that. No. It's, it's more of it's a different upbringing. I'll just say it that way. It's a different upbringing. you got to drive everywhere to have a play date and stuff. And it's very, it's very not Harrison. Right. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't want my kids. And, and again, like I said, I... I, I want this to come out right, but it probably won't anyway, so I'm just going to say it. I didn't want my kids to be soft. Okay. Uh, the Harris yeah, but they didn't have a choice to be soft. They're Ray Lucas' kids. Yeah, mm -hmm. but you know what? Sometimes, you, just listen, you always want better for your kids, right? Right. You always want to mm -hmm. think about it. But for me, more or less, uh, I learned how to be a man when I was living in Harris. You know I mean? I had the coaches that made me as tough as I am, that the guy that's in a different colored jersey is your enemy and that you want to destroy him at all costs. Uh, for me, I just thought my kids coming home, seeing how things are here, and, and I'm not saying we have a bunch of kids that live here, but we got tough kids. Right. And sometimes you got to put your hands up. You know what I'm saying? And, and for me, uh, even though Raven didn't talk to me for two months after we moved back, uh, <laughs> I don't think she, if you asked her, I don't think she wouldn't have regret anything. No. My, my kids are, are, are well-rounded here. Uh, they can walk anywhere they want to go. You know what I mean? The, the police, our chief here, Strumolo, uh, is an amazing man. Uh, community policing, anything I needed down the gardens and the kids of court, he does for me. Uh, it's just a different way of coming up. You know what I mean? It's a, it's a little bit harder. You know what I mean? It's working class kind of people here. Everybody has to have a job and stuff like that. And I, I just thought, it, you know, this is, listen, they always told me this one thing. You could take the boy out of Harrison. You've never taken the Harrison out of the boy. No way. And I wanted my kids to have that. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, well, did, Ray, this was an absolute joy. It took a while getting it done, but we finally got it done. But it's an absolute joy that I got a chance to, to spend the afternoon with you. Thanks so very, very much. And uh, and we obviously, I will see you somewhere down the road. And, you know, uh, you're, you're one of my all-time favorites, brother, and I love you dearly. And yeah, one of my all-time favorites, too, Jimmy. Don't change anything. And by the way, just so I can get this out, I'm a little freaking pissed off that you got let go from the Observer. So I haven't read the Observer since they let you go. No, I have I not. I got let go by the Hudson Reporter, but the Observer kept me. Oh, okay, so then it's the Hudson Reporter? Yeah, it's the Hudson right. Reporter right. letting right. me go. Right. The, the Observer, I'm still there, baby. Don't let that go. That's 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 my only bread and butter right, right now. Good. Then I'll stick with the Observer. Hudson, whatever the hell you just said, is out. They're out. They're out. They're out. Yeah, but the Hudson and, uh, the, and and all the other newspapers that I worked for in my entire career, they're all gone too. But the Observer, luckily, knock on wood, they they've stuck with me and I'm doing well. So. They know greatness when they see you, Jimmy. Yeah. They know greatness. Well, as I live, I live right around the corner from their offices, so they know that if they let me go, I would have sat out there and ha and stalked them to no end. Well, so guess what? There'll be two seats out there if the uh, Observer lets you go, and I'll be sitting in one of them with you, brother. Thank you so very much, Ray. And we will obviously right, will keep it. It will, we will definitely keep in touch, and you are the best, and I love you dearly. So, and give my I best to too, give my best to Ceci, who's the reason why this took place today. So, anyway. Well, she's the boss, dude. All these men around here think that they're the boss. No, then we all know we all know that. Hey, the queen is the boss. Hey. I have no shame in my game anymore. And my, hey, I'm married to a Harrison girl. I know better. So, you know, there's no. You better know better because uh, if you don't, you're gonna be in some trouble. Exactly. Well, exactly. So. Anyway, Ray, thanks so very much for sharing a few My minutes pleasure. with me today. All right, you're the best. I'll keep it keep in touch. And that was my special guest today. That was Ray Lucas, uh, who is still one of my all-time favorite athletes that I've ever covered and got to know. And uh, I appreciate you guys listening today. And I, once again, my special thanks to my executive producer, Johnny Haig, my nephew, my great nephew, who is the reason why this is this podcast even takes place so uh thanks again for listening we'll have another special guest next week thanks again for listening have a great day and stay safe everybody and do yourself a favor please please wear a mask so that if we wear if we wear just a mask 
It'll help to, it'll alleviate this coronavirus as soon as possible. Just put the mask on, and it'll it, we will have we'll be back to normal as sooner than you think. Okay. Thanks so much for listening. Have a great day, and we'll talk soon.